Being a developer, I think, is probably one of the best careers there is. I love it. But at the same time, it comes with a price. It comes with a price of continuous learning. If you're trying to keep up, you have to keep up with what you're doing. But it also comes with a price that what you do is no longer just like playing in, in the basement and creating, you know, sprites that move around the screen. What you're doing is changing the world. Yes, yeah, the obvious tech changes. Um, there's the societal changes that have happened. But there's an awful lot that's, it's just still us, it's still people, and we're still making, you know, very similar to mistakes that we were making 20 years ago. So if I were to say that in simple kind of Eric Johnson terms, I would say authentication is all about who you are, and authorization is all about what you have access to. Turns out Pixie actually solves a very small attack even if you have a client secret still. So what Pixie does is Pixie basically creates a new secret for every request, for every initiation of the flow. There's a lot of different points of view in the book, um, which I think is the other thing is that sometimes people will misquote the title as the 97 things every job <laughs> I should know. And I'm always keen to say, no, 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 this is just 97. It's, it's, it's a sample of a much bigger A97 story. things. So I, I saw, I read some of the reviews, like you should never read reviews. It's like reading comments on YouTube. Um, yeah. But I read some of the reviews and some of the reviews are like, oh, these 97 things are contradictory. Um, but that's very much part of the point because our industry is like that. And the ultimate answer for everything is it depends. So if it depends, then one right answer in one circumstance is not the same right answer in another circumstance. So it's really important to have like, 73 different voices, talk about 97 different things, some of which are contradictory. And sometimes it can even be the same author doing two contradictory points of view because, you know, that's that's the reality of, of software. And what's nice about, you know, modern graph databases is you don't need to understand the internals of those. You can just say, oi, database, tell me who's popular, or tell me which node is popular. Oi, database, tell me which nodes are similar. Oi, database, tell me tell me about the cliques in this graph, the neighborhoods in this graph, that kind of thing. If you've got unstructured data, you can run NLP over that, do entity recognition, and then actually put that into the graph and then do the analysis from there. So yeah, as you say, you can do it sort of afterwards, during, and before as well is, before, is a good yeah. pattern. In fact, in fact, that's how, I'm, as I understand it, that's how things like, um, like Amazon Alexa and stuff work. Yeah. They have exactly that kind of pattern. So e even the stuff, the, the, the commodity stuff that we have around our houses is at some level graph powered in that way. Yeah. When they hear about the service mesh, it's awesome. You know, we can fix a lot of problems we have uh, around our microservice architecture. It does make the introduction of my microservice architecture so much easier. And it's true because the the ideal uh, place for, for service mesh is a microservice architecture um, where you have many services and many different languages. Because this, this is the, the point where it's really hard to put all these cross-cutting concerns in each of your service. Because if you have different languages, you can't rely on the same library, for example. This is so, so very important. Um, as an architect, you have to decide uh, for your system which architecture fits that specific system. And uh, you shouldn't rely on someone telling you, well, obviously, for all the cases, this is the one architecture. As, as JetBrains is a company that does tooling, you know, the, the vast majority of our code was based on Java. And uh, we were looking for other ways to write code uh, to make it a little bit more concise, to have access to certain features such as lambdas, which at the time weren't available. You know, we're talking back in 2009, 2000, uh, early 2010 when Kotlin started. Uh, developers rarely tell me they like Kotlin. They always tell me they love Kotlin, and and that that really is exciting to see developers expressing such such ideas about a language. And the minute you start exper experiencing Kotlin, you are blown away by the sheer richness of the language, and 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 that's the fun part of the language itself, in my opinion, is that the language has so much to give. Uh, for developers. And, and one of the things also that excites me about Kotlin is 
Kartan is a language that treats me as an adult. It doesn't insult me, right? It doesn't tell me, you need to know better. Here's how you do things. The whole objective of machine learning is to automate and optimize decisions, but single decisions, only one decision. The difference between that and reinforcement learning is that reinforcement learning attempts to model and therefore optimize sequential decision making. So not just one decision. One of the things that you highlight throughout the book, which is the importance of the problem definition. Um, at one point you actually say all projects start with a problem definition and it's often wrong which is um, kind of a, a, a basic tenet that we hear in statistics all the time. Like, you know, all models are wrong, but hopefully some of them are useful. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.